What's up, everybody? Welcome back to the Noncast. I'm your host, Alec Heidel, and on this week's show, I got a chance to sit down with Sasso Luzner of The Venus Project. Not sure what The Venus Project is? Take a listen. What is The Venus Project? The Venus Project offers a new socioeconomic system that isn't capitalism, communism, socialism, nor fascism. It's nothing like anything that has ever been tried before. It's not a dictatorship, nor is it democratic. Yet it will achieve what all democracies have always tried to and never did. Freedom from violence, abuse, coercion, and restrictions that are unnecessary and only serve a small minority at the expense of the rest. It is a system that works for all of us and the environment we depend on. It seems that society today is unable to provide many people with a high standard of living, although it has been technically possible to do so for quite a while. There are many technical solutions that have been around for many years for housing, transportation, creating clean renewable energy, growing nutritious food, and providing clean water. But very little has been done to put them into practice due to the insufficiencies of the social structure we live in today. The Venus Project offers a system that would invite those technologies in, shorten the workday, and raise the standard of living higher than what most people realize possible. We invite you to learn about The Venus Project at thevenusproject.com. Great. Well, Sasa, welcome to the show. Uh, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. Not a problem whatsoever. So um, let's start off with some basics. What exactly is The Venus Project? Well, it's a question that doesn't have a short answer, but um, generally it's basically an organization that proposes an alternative arrangement of social system that we have right now um, using the technologies of today um, for the social concern. That would be kind of the really so short the Ven- version. So part of the Venus Project is is – the creation of a new socioeconomic system. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, exactly. Um, It's uh, what we call the resource-based economy, um, meaning that we would try to overcome some of the problems that we see with the current monetary-based economy, which is, you know, as you all know, scarcity, uh, poverty, hunger, uh, things that really should have been eradicated by now but we're still struggling with it, um, and it's mostly due to our uh, inefficient social systems that we have and economic systems. Well, what exactly is wrong with the current social systems that we utilize today? Well, the monetary system, the way that it's set up right now, just doesn't work for everyone um, because it's not designed to provide abundance. It is based on scarcity. If you want to... Uh, to sell something at a good price, then you have to make sure that it's not too abundant because otherwise you have a problem selling it. Um, from a practical point of view, you know, we can see this with, um, with you know, air. Nobody's selling air. Nobody's selling you a, a bucket of sand on the beach because there's enough for everyone. Um, but we've already seen with some resources that that's not the case anymore. Water was pretty much free for most of, 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 of the time and is right now uh, being prized high because of, uh, because of all the problems with pollution, with, uh, with all sorts of different things. So we're kind of creating our own problems instead of solving the problems that we have. Now, what's the difference between what we have now and what would be this resource-based economy? Um, well, there's a, there's a lot of uh, a lot of differences, um, and it's uh, it's it's a lot it's a lot to talk about, I guess. Um, the major one of the major differences would be that the technology and all the education, all the skills that we currently have, would be used for social concern, would be used to solve the problems that we've just discussed before. So. Um, people being unemployed, being homeless, um, things, things that, you know, really shouldn't be happening, like we mentioned. And we can do that by intelligently managing resources, um, distributing the resources to everyone. Uh, we produce more than enough things for everyone, but not everyone has the money, uh, the monetary means to afford them. So, 
you know, these are these are some of the basics. And of course, we should be talking about education too, different uh, different type of education, um, you know, different type of work environment that wouldn't be a job as you know it today, just so that you can survive. But you know, would be something that you would want to engage in because it would add to um, to the benefit of all the people in the world. And those are those are the things that are missing today. Well, it would seem as though, in order to achieve these goals, you really would need to start fundamentally changing how people think, how people feel, how people feel about each other. Um, and people would really have to want to work towards this common goal. And it seems in society right now, um, there are no common goals that we're working towards. Uh, how do you hope to get people on board and change their mindset and get them interested in moving in this direction? Oh, that's a great question right there. Um, it's, uh, it's a multitude of things that we have to do. I would say definitely first one is try to create awareness of the solutions so that people understand and see that there are alternatives out there that are proposing different things uh, that might challenge some people's way of life or their view of how the world works. Um, but that's really what we need for us to start going in a different direction. Uh, I think that's kind of the first step. And, and in a lot of ways, I think the Internet is definitely a tool that enables us better than ever to try and get that information out there. And um, and I think that's why it's so crucial for, for organizations, you know, such as such as Anonymous as well and a lot of others that want to make sure that the internet, you know, stays a platform that's open for, for everyone. Um, and so, of course, there's, uh, there's other things that we also have to do. Um, we are definitely trying to get, um, you know, a bigger research center started or even a city that would be um, ideal so that we can show physically how this kind of, uh, society would actually work, um, that we can test these ideas, that we can physically show people how this will benefit their lives and how it will, you know, change them for the better. And, um, and if you think about it, that's really the way that we adopt change. You know, um, when we started with these, you know, cell phones, people that had them, were were you know a few people that were interested in technical gadgetry and they were looked at you know weirdly because they had this huge bricks on their on their ears um but you know right now people are just uh can't really think of how we lived without these cell phones and so you know every time uh we have let's say change like this on our doorstep it seems overwhelming in the beginning people don't really uh, like it. They don't want to take it in. But after they see the benefits, um, you know, then they see that, okay, this is something that I can use because it makes my life better. And this is what we would like to show with with all our materials and, and hopefully, you know, with um, with a research center like that or a city. And, you know, nobody could, could really um, say, well, you know, it's just a pipe dream. No, it's right here. And this is how it works. Now, the Venus Project, uh, you currently have a research center in Florida in the United States. Is that correct? Yes. Yes, there is. There is a, a, a research center in Florida. Um, the Venus Project itself is is named after a small town of Venus where the, the project is currently. Um, it is a small research center that pretty much Jacques and Roxanne built on their own, uh, very much with their own hands in a lot of ways, too. Uh, started off in back in the 80s um, and now all the way to, to 2015 16 um, but of course it's uh, it's not a big enough platform to really show a lot of the ideas that we want that we have to um, and uh, and so you know we're looking for 
next steps, and we're going to be talking a little bit about that as we go as well. Now, you mentioned uh, Jacques. I, that was uh, Jacques Fresco. He's the founder of the Venus Project. Uh, could you uh, tell us a little bit about Jacques and uh, what led him to uh, found the Venus Project? Yeah, uh, there's there's so many things, I guess, to say about Jacques that it's kind of hard to, to, to know where to begin. Um, I presume that some of the listeners uh, have, have heard of him and, and know some of the things about him. Uh, he's an engineer, a social designer, uh, inventor, uh, you know, scientist, I guess, researcher in a lot of ways. And um, he is he has been around um, for a very long time researching uh, a lot of the things that we've talked about uh, during this interview. And what he has done is compiled, I guess, all this research and also a lot of the things that that he read from other people, et cetera, et cetera, into a really comprehensive set of ideas and proposals to really change the society and apply all of his technical knowledge and skills and inventions into a system that would work for the benefit of, of humanity. And, um, and he has been pretty much relentless uh, over the course of his 99 years and um, and he's uh, the last 40 years, of course, with his uh, associate and partner, Roxanne Meadows. They've been in Venus uh, all this time and, and developing all sorts of uh, things such as uh, 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 blueprints and and models and and different things that will that will help uh, promote the project, such as, you know, media and, and documentaries, etc. So. Um, so it's I, I don't really know uh, what to say about Jacques. You know, he's definitely one of the reasons why I'm here talking to you right now. He's he's uh, one of the people that kind of opened up my mind to to all the things that we're talking about here, and I think he's done so for for a lot of other people as well. Now, the Venus Project doesn't seem to be only a new socioeconomic system. It seems to incorporate a lot of other aspects, uh, including architecture, um, power systems. Uh, could you talk to us a little bit about um, innovations in architecture? And Yeah, it's um, – there's really – this is really, a, I would say, a compilation of all of the things that seem to work best. And a lot of these things are also taken from nature – um, and things like that. So that's why you see a lot of the buildings and cities and designs in general from Jacques are very organic, are very round or circular, um, you know, or have these natural curves to them. Um, but they are not just nice to look at. They're also very strong. Um, nature uh, uh, kind of builds things round uh you know a lot of people say well i don't want to live in a dome city or a dome house but you know the the brain lives inside of a dome for his whole life for its own life so you know we've been kind of living in in domes anyway like it or not um and so it's it's very strong it's very durable um and of course it makes a lot of sense from the engineering part um a circular city means that there are that there's equal distances from you know di from different points of the city where you can access things like healthcare um, and all these important things and no ne not necessary to backtrack you know go one direction and then come back the same way etc cetera, etc cetera. so a lot of these benefits um, are incorporated in the designs and everything that Jacques makes is is there with a purpose with with a function in mind and usually not just one all the you know buildings are also heat concentrators or social uh sorry or solar collectors or you know have a second function uh pretty much always so that we try and incorporate as many things in the least amount of of area as possible so and how do these cities and this 
innovative form of architecture, how does that integrate uh, with local ecology? Is it eco-friendly? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. That's actually one of the biggest concerns, of course, that we have right now. Um, we have seen that, you know, cities are kind of this cancerous formation that just kind of grows and grows and grows exponentially because people just move into the city and we add to them. Um, whereas this would be very different. So we would, you know, before the city is built, we would have to make a survey of what the local area can really support, how many people, you know, what kind of uh, um, buildings, all these things. And once the city is built, it's going to be for a certain amount of people. So let's say that it's a city for 200,000. And we don't want to pile more people in that city because it's designed for 200,000. And it has, you know, the least amount of, of, of footprint on the on the environment. And so what we would rather do is we would rather build another city, maybe 50 miles away or, you know, where um, where again it's planned and again it has only a certain effect on, on, on the environment. And so this would really let um, nature reclaim back a lot of, a lot of the lost or destroyed in a lot of, uh, in a lot of areas land um, that we've, uh, you know, that we've kind of squandered over, over the years. So yes, it definitely has that in mind. Now, one of the biggest problems with with people in general, uh, is we kind of move into an area, we absorb resources, and then we have to either move on or import resources into that area. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Now, now, uh, how sustainable are these new model cities? Do they, are they designed to replenish resources? Yeah, they would be, they would be designed to, uh, replenish net sort resources, especially the natural resources, the ones that can, you know, renew themselves if we let them, um, such as, you know, wood, uh, uh, and different things. And of course, all the, our, all the nature, uh, the biotic diversity, you know, animals and everything, uh, right now we're, we're, we're pretty much the reason for a mass extinction that's going on worldwide. And that's something that we really need to stop. And so, um, and of course, there's there's another factor here. We have to start building and creating things that have recycling in mind, that have um, reuse in mind, that have, you know, minimum footprint in mind, so that something that gets built is going to be there for a long period of time that is not going to need a lot of additional resources, like you mentioned, to get hauled from, you know, halfway around the world um, just to upgrade or just to, uh, you know, have support for this one city that happens to be uh, in a certain place. You know, that's, that's kind of the today's mentality. You know, if you look at cities are, <laughs> a lot of cities are built in the middle of the desert and, you know, the, the resources for the city, the energy, a lot of these different things are just hauled from all over the world into, you know, a barren place where there's really no way to, well, not no way, but right now would they have no way of, of, of making sure that they have enough for themselves. No, they're pretty much uh, uh, destroying the world somewhere else and then transporting that re those resources to to a local area and that's something that that we want to you know avoid very much it's uh it's it's a very detrimental practice that we have now this the idea for the venus project really is a is a one world global community uh would you say that that's accurate um yeah if in a lot of ways yes resource-based economy by definition is is global so you can't in today's world you just can't live to yourself anymore you know it's it's impossible the pollution doesn't need any passports um you know all these different things that happen on one side of the world have an impact everywhere and we really need to start waking up to that fact you know this is one world um there's 
really, you know, con there's really no more countries in that sense. This is something that we've created. We've, you know, out of our uh, 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 social evolution, but practically there is really no such thing. And so what we're calling for here is, is to, for start, at least everyone to start collaborating on these big issues that we have, that we've already mentioned, um, you know, big environmental degradation and, and pollution and using of the natural resources at, you know, an accelerated pace that just cannot be maintained long term. There's so many things that we as a global community have to start talking about that, you know, if we don't do that, it's not that the Venus Project is, you know, proposes something something impossible, but if we don't do it, we're going to feel the consequences. And, you know, with the global, with a uh, global climate change summit that was happening right now, we could see a little bit of that, you know, the little bit of discussion of, oh, well, you know, what we're doing kind of has implications all over the planet, et cetera, et cetera. But the resolve from that is, you know, very underwhelming. There's, you know, there has to be concrete steps taken um, if we want to, you know, improve these things. Otherwise, it's just uh, it's just proclamations and 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 verbal, uh, uh, you know, pastime. So that's really the big problem. Now, my question is, would these ideas and concepts be integrated into current systems of government, or are they meant to replace current systems of government? Well, there is definitely going to be a period of transition. Um, there's, there's really no way to, to avoid that. I, I don't think it's realistic that we would just uh, – overnight change to a different system that's just not really how social evolution works um but i think that the goal yes should be that we overcome the current the current systems and really go into something that will apply the technology of the 21st century um and also you know get these realizations of automation of of uh, technological unemployment that is happening um, and all these things acknowledged and then start to look into well what are we going to do about it and a proposal such as a resource-based economy uh, deals with exactly that um, and one of the things that I think while well, this is a really great question and I've struggled with that question when I started to get involved you know, what, how are you going to govern something if there is no, you know, political system anymore? And one of the great examples that, that I now like to use that made things clearer for me is, is the human body. You know, there's, there's really no political system in the human body. There are no, uh, 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 you know, surveys uh, done. There are no discussions. There are no committee meetings. Um, if you get, you know, some sort of an infection, if you get a cut on your foot or whatever happens, the body responds because, you know, it, it knows what it needs. And if, if there was, you know, meetings and things and, and, you know, it would take two weeks for the body to respond, you would have to cut off your foot or something like that. It just wouldn't work. Um, the organs of the body itself, too, you know, there's no the most important organ, you know, we, we might perceive that as the brain and the heart, but, you know, without the lungs, all that is, 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 uh, uh, can't function without the liver, without all these different things. And so having this kind of, uh, 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 competition would, would mean that the body would die. And this is kind of what we're doing right now. And the Venus project would propose something that would actually, you know, start the collaboration as it, as it should um, because you don't really need a politician to fly over an area and say, oh, yes, we have drought here. Let's do something about it. Um, you know, that should be obvious. If you have sensors in the soil um, that indicate that there's not enough moisture, not enough water, they activate the pumps, the water comes in, irrigates the land. And, you know, that's that's really what you need to substitute the 
you know, human factor with. And, you know, the vast majority of decisions like this can can be automated and, and already are in some cases. So the socioeconomic system of the Venus Project doesn't entail um, a, a typical currency. Is that correct? Yes, yes, that is correct. Um, the monetary system or just... I guess any kind of currency system that we have is scarcity based. So what we want to do is we want to provide abundance. So if something is in abundance, it usually doesn't have a price tag on it. So kind of what we mentioned before, you know, the, the, the air itself doesn't have a price tag, price tag on it because there's so much of it. Uh, it's now getting arguable quality of air, but let's put you know put that to the side. Um, so if you create if you create things um, with the purpose that you're going to make them abundant, then they will you know they cannot be sold anymore, and that's really the long term goal. Again, this is not something that's going to be done overnight, but. Yes, it definitely. Um, and then also some of the other negative consequences are corruption, you know, all these vested interests. If you do this, I'm going to do this and we're going to make money. Um, you know, this competition, people can afford certain things, other people can't. Um, and then you have envy and all these different, all these different things and anomalies and, 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 and negative, uh, uh, you know, behaviors in the society just because you have this monetary system. I think the biggest challenge uh, to a system like that is overcoming um, that overcoming greed on an individual level and avoiding things like gluttony, which could absolutely be a byproduct of this system? How would you overcome things like that? Yeah, I mean, greed is greed is something that, you know, we have in this society and, and to an extent all of us exhibit, you know, uh, greed in some ways or, 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 or another. But um, well, let me ask you, let me ask you a side question. Do you yeah. think that greed is a byproduct of the consumerist society that we have created for ourselves. Yes, yes, yes. I definitely think it is a byproduct. Um, of course, it's not just the current society. I think that any society that has, you know, elites, that has this differential advantage, that has monetary system or, you know, or a system that they had even back in the ancient days where, you know, silver was prized and gold is prized like it is now and was used for currency. Um, we pretty much see the same the same problems. So yes, it is it is manifested um, that way. I think a lot of people have a hard time accepting that. I think the majority of people just think that because uh, because greed is so widespread and has been pretty much over over uh, history as well that it's just innate and it is just there and we can't do anything about it. Um, and that, if that were true, then you would not have, you know, millions of people volunteering, millions of people doing things that they get, they don't get paid for. They don't have monetary incentive for, um, they oftentimes even pay out of their own pockets just to do these things. So, you know, motivation to do something and, and function in the society is not solely monetary based, like many people think. Um, so that's really something that we have to, well, emphasize. And, um, and once, you know, once enough people kind of see that, then you can see that the mechanisms that we currently use are perpetuating the exact opposite, you know, the competition, uh, having more than the other person, um, and, you know, this, this kind of goes uh, along very practical lines. You know, if somebody does better at a certain job than you, then you might lose your job. Or if you have a business, they might, might uh, you know, outcompete you and you might lose, you know, your revenue. And so you're very, you're, you know, motivated by this cutthroat do or die kind of mentality. 
and that's not necessarily the only kind of of, of motivation that that we can that we have so yeah we should we should make the emphasis on the other side we should make the emphasis on on volunteering on making things or or uh joining things organizations that are doing things that are good for the community um and not just for an individual and if we foster that kind of mentality then the next generations will you know have that too and that kind of attitude and that's really you know that's really the social aspect of 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 what a resource based economy would would try to achieve in that sense now the venus project also has some proposals for new energy systems uh, in particular uh, a bearing straight bridge energy system could you talk a little bit about that um there is I I personally will just come right out and say it. I don't have enough information on that project in particular to really give you the details. But I will say I will say this in general, um, as far as the energy problem problems are concerned of today, um, they're twofold. Uh, one is we just use too much. <laughs> uh, we are so wasteful in using our energy that realistically if you would really efficiently organize society with public transportation with automation with a lot of the things that we propose here um you would dramatically reduce the need for energy as far as uh the current levels and that's really the first step um and that's something that we have to take into account because people generally don't want to even consider that it's just a it's just a given that we're going to need more and more energy um and within the current system that's true uh and as far as the energy sources are concerned there are so many so many safe sources of renewable energy that i i don't think that should really be an issue i mean we can see it even if in the in today's world where you know where it's still monetary driven that there are countries that have, you know are going towards pretty much 100% renewable energy rates so that's not something that that's you know that's that's impossible and actually in the new movie the choice is ours that's coming out um there is a there is one of the form, foremost scientists uh that talks about these these issues and he actually has a proposal of of uh you know turning uh for for the US the US economy onto renewables in just 15 years even without any kind of implementation of of the resource based economy that we're talking about but just within the monetary system so this is really not something that that should be you know that 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 should be problematic um from that point of view and um i think that we've maybe uh been talking a lot about the technological aspect of the project itself but uh but I think the big challenge is actually the the social shift and the shift in you know changing people's behavior and 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 just their outlook on life and collaboration and what is important what are the basic human needs that we that that you know every human uh needs and wants so um those are really those are really some of the issues that are holding us back in a lot of ways. Well, it would seem that the social aspect of it is definitely tied to uh the technology and there's a heavy emphasis on automation. Uh we know that in factories today as things become automi- uh, automized people lose jobs. Uh, so let me ask you this: in, If there's there's no money, and if automation replaces a lot of the need for manual labor, um, mm-hmm. are, do people work? Um, what what are people doing with their time? Uh, populations are constantly growing. Are, is, is there uh, a, a need for these people in the workplace? Well, that's that's a, that's one of the big questions that I think is is more plaguing us in today's system than it would in a resource-based economy. But of course, it's a very valid question. You know, what um, what do you do? Um, I think one of the things that 
we would try to do is 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 of course automate the laborious, monotonous, repetitive jobs, and um, we would have tremendous amount of people working on basically repairing the damage that we have done in the last hundred or so years to the environment, um, to the you know animal populations, to uh, to pollution in different ways. So all of the, just, just those things and creating this, uh, new infrastructure and, and a lot of the new designs and new plans and things like that, there would be a huge amount of, of work that would need to be done, even though it wouldn't be, you know, a job a nine to five. Um, and that's where a lot of the people, would actually engage in what they're doing and i think a lot of a lot of emphasis would be given also on the education or you know re-education in a lot of ways too um of everyone really because we've been conditioned through this culture and all the cultures in the world in different ways you know to um to want different things that are maybe not very important really to to the to the human life um and and all these different things so i i don't think there would be a shortage of things to do um but in today's culture i think this is a very big problem um because you know what what are these what are these people going going to do um, there's already a high unemployment rate. It's uh, it's a lot higher than what it is statistically, as we you know as we know. There's a lot of people that are that are not even listed as unemployed, even though they are, and all these things. And so you know all all those social problems already plague a lot of the developed world, and they're going to continue to to get worse. Um, so yeah, automation I think is a, a, a big part of the resource-based economy as well but um but the challenge the challenges will really lie into having that automation and focus it on social concern that's that's really what we're missing right now you know all these great technologies that we already have are just not used for the social concern of all the world's people that's that's really that's really the big problem now let me ask you where does religion fit into this is there any sort of religious connection with the venus project um well there is there is no uh, direct religious connection with the venus project but i would say that all the religion all the religions except for the I would say religious fundamentalists maybe, but all the religions generally talk about, you know, a better world that they want to create or the better world that's waiting for them in the afterlife or, you know, whatever it is. Um, and we're just saying, well, let's build this world right here. You know, we have the capability. Um, we have the, the, the option to do it. We have the technology to do it. So, you know, what would be a more if you want to call it that spiritual uh, or religious uh, uh, focus, then to make the world a better place. You know, uh, I think, I think that's, that's kind of the, the, the best, the best thing that I think I can do for the world. Um, and so that would be, you know, that would be my answer, but, uh, but the religious, you know, religion itself, um, we, we generally, uh, don't you know? Don't really engage in in that aspect. Uh, the Venus Project really seems to be one of the most ambitious projects that I've ever uh, researched. Uh, how do you continue to fund the Venus Project currently, and what kind of staffing do you have? Uh, and is that staffing uh, localized in Florida, or is it around the world? Um, that's a great question. Actually, it most of our efforts right now are volunteer based. Um, we don't really have we don't really have any people that are full time employed uh, in uh, let's say in the traditional sense. Of course, we have Jacques and Roxanne who are um, who are in in Venus and they're working on things. 
Um, and they pretty much finance themselves um, with the tours that they have. So every Saturday uh, they have a tour. People can see the center, can, you know, ask Jacques and Roxanne questions. And so, you know, hang out there and see what um, what they've built and, and what the proposals are there for for five, six hours. And um, and so they use that to support themselves. Um, most of our information is free online, except for a few things, again, that they use to support themselves. One is the book, The Best That Money Can't Buy. Um, two of the other books are freely available. This one is, is used basically for support of the, of the project. Um, and, uh, and a few, and a few other things, um, basically a few lectures, the ones that are not free online, again, for the same purpose of, of, of that support. And, uh, everything else, everything else you can pretty much find free online. All the documentaries that were made either by them or by other people that feature the Venus project, uh, you can find free online. So, um, you know, so the information is there, but all the rest of us, I guess, are volunteers in to various degrees of, in, of involvement. Um, some have more time, of course, than others. Um, some groups are bigger than others. We're currently present in about 40 uh, different uh, uh, countries and states in the world. And, um, and so we're doing various, various things that we can with our own, uh, with our own funding or without funding, which I presume that, um, you guys know a little bit about as well. So, so that's really the extent of, 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 of our activities, um, right now. Um, and we're, of course, have various global projects that are, that are running um, right now, like I mentioned before, the movie The Choice is Ours is coming out. It's um, it's a documentary movie that's going to be about an hour and 35 minutes. It is, I would say, probably the most comprehensive view of the Venus Project and its proposals uh, that will be recorded up to date. And it will also be uh, very high quality in the sense of video, audio. Um, there's going to be some 3D animations. Uh, Jacques is going to talk a little bit more about the city, why they are the way they are, um, and some of the functions. So it's it will be it will be uh, I think one of the uh, uh, milestones because we're going to try and get that movie out in in uh, different local theaters, uh, maybe some, some TV um, uh, broadcasting. Um, we'll see. I mean, whatever, whatever we're going to, um, we're going to try and do. And the movie is coming out of, um, in the second part of, of, uh, of January. So uh, likely the release date is going to be on the 20th of January. Now I watched uh, an online uh, seminar on the Venus Project that you did from uh, 2013, and you talked about ways that people could get involved offline and online. Uh, could you tell us how people can get involved in both of those ways? Um, yeah, so this is a primary, primarily, I guess one of um, one of the things that I'm personally invested in is a global education and uh, basically finding people that would want to start teams, local teams or global teams um, around the world. And um, basically the way that you can get involved is right now under the uh, main website, www.thevenusproject.com, you can go under Get Involved, and you have all the different ways of getting involved. You can search by you know, people that are near you, see if there is a point of contact that is near you in your state or in your country. And if there isn't one, you can uh, email us directly at admin, admin at TVP activism and see if, uh, if you want to get involved that maybe we can, you know, help you start um, a local group. And so to get involved offline or face to face, you can do that if there is already a group near you. We have, like I mentioned, different size groups that are that are that have different local projects running, um, 
And we have also global groups, which are things like social media, like graphics department, um, all these different groups that are international that work online mostly um, and create content for the different social media or for different events or for anything that is needed really. And then, um, and then of course, one of the big, one of the big organizations is the linguistic team international, which is a huge team that does voluntary, um, volunteer translations. Um, they're an amazing group, um, of people that we always collaborate on. Um, and right now, you know, for example, we're translating the Choices Ours movie and uh, the first two parts that came out, we've translated them into 29 languages before the movie even came out. And it was all through volunteer effort. So so there is a lot of ways that you can get involved um, under the, you know, under the get involved in the website, you can pretty much find all the information. Now, you guys have a big event coming up on March the 12th in Fort Myers, Florida. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, a really, it's a really awesome event. Um, Jacques is going to be uh, 100 on, uh, on March 13th. So it's, uh, he's not a big fan of birthdays, so he doesn't really care about his, his birthday. But, um, but we kind of wanted to do something special just from the perspective of, you know, a hundred years of persons of a person's life dedicated really to trying to change the world and improve, uh, a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of the problems that we have right now and, you know, still going strong, like still doing all these, uh, uh tours every Saturday, uh, still doing Skype conferences uh if necessary and things like that so it's really an inspiration and and we're going to try of course and make it um also informational and educational uh we're going to have henry schlinger uh there speaking one of the foremost behavioral scientists uh he's going to be coming in he also was one of the people that was interviewed for the movie the choice is ours uh really an awesome guy um, we're going to have Abby Martin that's going to join us, uh, who's now hosting the, um, Empire Files. You've probably, uh, heard of her and, um, she's going to be, uh, talking a little bit about uh, the current, you know, social problems and some of the things that she's, uh, doing. And we're going to have, of course, Jacques and Roxanne, um, and hopefully one more guest that I currently can't really comment on because we don't have him or her confirmed yet. But, um, and there's going to be some TVP activities, of course, to go with that. And it's going to be a one day event, um, in Fort Myers, Florida. So you can find, you can find that also, uh, on the main website or on our the Venus Project Global Facebook group, um, and all those, all those social media outlets. All right. Well, Sasso, I appreciate you joining us today. Anything else you'd like to comment on before we get out of here? Well, I don't know. There's there's so many things to talk about. I'm sure that uh, that we forgot something or other. But um, but no, it was, I think that we covered most of the things that that um, that we really had have active right now. And uh, I just want to thank you for uh, for hosting uh, for hosting me. And uh, I want to thank you for. Your support. I know that you guys have already uh, done uh, some some pieces on the Venus Project and everything. It's really great to see you guys uh, get involved, and in, and I hope we can do more things in the future. Uh, yes, we absolutely will. We'll definitely stay in touch, and uh, anything we can do to help you, just let us know. Well, as soon as as soon as we have more stuff coming out, as far as the choice is ours, and also the centennial celebration and everything. Um, we'll, we'll send it your way. And if you guys want to share it, um, on your social media, that would be great. And hopefully, uh, even see some of you there. So, um, so if you come over, just, uh, uh, come over and say hi. I am actually hoping to make the trip. I'm supposed to be down in Florida, um, in that time of the year. So I'm going to see if I can coordinate the dates to make it. I think it'll be a great time. Yeah, it would. It would be great to meet you if you, if you can do that. So yeah, looking forward to that. 
All right. Well, Sasso, thanks for joining us. That about wraps up this week's show. I'm your host, Alec Heidel. Make sure you tune in next week when I'll be speaking with David Cole about his book, Republican Party Animal, and his unique views on the Holocaust. You can hit us up at the Anoncast on Twitter or podcast at anonhq.com. See you guys soon.